Good afternoon, everybody. I am so excited to welcome you today to our program. My name is Mona Ragla. I'm the Director of Membership and Programming at Central Exchange. And we are always so grateful for our partnership with Advent. Uh, the Living in Vitality program is something that we've got a wonderful partnership with. And to be able to host some of the amazing presenters and learn from them is one of the uh, things that we are very, very grateful for at Central Exchange. And so I'm going to introduce uh, Megan Parsons. Megan is the manager of the Whole Health Institute at Advent South, uh, and she is going to introduce our presenters today. So again, welcome, Megan. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Good. Awesome. Well, good afternoon. So nice to see all of you today. I'm Megan Parsons, as Mona had said. I'm the manager of the new Advent Health Whole Health Institute down at Advent Health South Overland Park. Today's presentation is brought to you by Advent Health's Living in Vitality Women's Health Programming. Through our uplifting and educational annual conference, wellness activities, wellness events, and more, Living in Vitality's mission is to empower Kansas City women to live healthier lives physically, mentally, and spiritually. We're excited to move forward with Living in Vitality as an in-person conference this year, uh, set for Friday, October 1st at the Overland Park Convention Center. Attendees will um, enjoy three national keynotes, 18 breakout sessions, health screenings, gifts, and more. You'll also see my providers uh, from the Whole Health Institute there as well. Um, today's speakers will both be presenting at this year's conference. So we hope you will take the opportunity to recharge as we live with purpose this year. Um, and you can learn more about that and get uh, registered to join us on October 1st at adventhealth.com slash LIV. With that, I'm happy to introduce our speakers today. Uh, we have Dr. Elaine Demetrulis, is an interventional cardiologist here at Advent Health, who is board certified in cardiovascular disease and interventional cardiology. She is an expert in complex percutaneous coronary intervention using a radial approach. She earned her medical degree from the University of Iowa College of Medicine and completed a residency in internal medicine and fellowships in cardiology and interventional cardiology at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. And next we have Lisa Markley. She is an integrative dietitian and seasoned culinary nutrition expert with the Whole Health Institute. I get the pleasure of working with her every day. Uh, with nearly two decades of experience working towards improving the health of individuals and the community, Lisa offers nutrition consultations and classes where she passionately educates, empowers clients and uh, class participants to harness the healing power of food and healthful lifestyle changes. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, I, I will be monitoring the chat. So if you do have questions throughout the presentation, please do so throw your questions in the chat box. Um, and I will make sure that we address those as we go along on today's presentation. And if we don't get to them, we're, there will be about five to 10 minutes at the end um, to ask and answer any questions that you still may have. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Demetrulis. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, present and meet everyone here today and looking forward definitely to meeting everybody in person. So I'd like to talk today about heart disease in women and just a brief outline of uh, what we'd like to go through today. Uh, talk a little bit about just some terminology. So heart disease and what that encompasses, specifically talk about coronary artery disease as that's the most common form of heart disease. Um, go through some symptoms, diagnostic tools, ways that we actually visualize the heart arteries, um, some conclusions. And then if we do have some time, I do have a few procedural pictures um, of heart arteries that uh, people find interesting most times. So in talking about heart disease, there are various types of heart disease. There can be disease of the valves, just of the electrical system. So people can sometimes just need a pacemaker. There can be disorders of the heart muscle itself. And then there can be narrowings in the heart arteries. And there are even more than this, but those are some of the broad categories. Um, today, I'm gonna to focus on the most common type of heart disease, which is coronary artery disease. Other terms that are used for this, atherosclerosis, 
hardening of the arteries, heart artery disease, blockages in heart arteries, um, and I'm sure there are more, but those are some of the more common ones. So pictures tend to kind of help uh, in understanding. I'm gonna use my mouse here, but um, this is a picture of a heart and there are three main blood vessels, the left main artery, and then the left anterior descending goes down the front of the heart, the left circumflex goes around one side and the right coronary artery goes around the other side of the heart. Um, in kind of a cartoon format, a normal artery is nice and clean on the inside, allows for excellent blood flow. And when there's buildup, plaque, narrowings, um, you can see that, especially here in a cross section, this one's reduced by about 50%. So this is uh, what I'd like to focus on today. So why is this important? Heart disease is the number one killer of women in the United States um, and increased risk of heart attacks. So not only from a mortality or dying perspective, but having a heart attack also predisposes people to having heart failure and other, um, and, and then that often can lead to other organs having difficulties. So um, I think some people are surprised to know that it is the number one killer of women in the United States, but, but it is. And so how do you know if you have this combination of symptoms and seeking uh, evaluation for it? So what are the known risk factors for developing coronary artery disease? Uh, age, as we get older, uh, we all develop probably some amount of it. Uh, smoking is a big risk factor, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, having a family history of coronary disease. And this is typically um, more in the sense of do people get premature coronary disease? So the definition of that would be women having coronary disease before the age of 40 or men before the age of 50. Excuse me. Elevated bad cholesterol, which is the LDL, a decreased or low good cholesterol, which is the HDL, and elevated triglycerides. Those are things that are definitely influenced by dietary and exercise habits, uh, and then obesity and physical inactivity. So several of these things are modifiable. A couple of them are not. I guess age really is about the only one. Everything else can be modified in some way, either with medications or through lifestyle modifications and diet. So what kind of symptoms do people get? when they have narrowings in their heart arteries. So when you have less blood flow through a blood vessel that decreases the oxygen supply to the muscle itself, and that is what the cause of what the symptoms are. If you hear the term angina, that is the general term that encompasses any kind of symptom that is caused by that low oxygen or low blood flow to the heart muscle. Um, these symptoms should be considered as the warning sign and I mean by that mostly that they should not be ignored and need further evaluation. So the most common symptom of having narrowings in the heart arteries is some type of chest pain or discomfort. And that is in all patients, men, women, um, of all ages as well. Now, this may be a sign of heart disease, it may not be. There are a lot of other things that can cause chest pain, but this is by far and away the most common. It can be described in many different ways. And um, some patients get a very classic pressure, squeezing band-like sensation in the middle of their chest. Some people describe more of a burning sensation, but any of these things, we kind of talk about any symptom from sort of the neck down to the navel that is unusual that you recognize as new should have some sort of evaluation. So what are some of the features, I guess, of this chest pain or pressure? So some, some symptoms are regarded as very typical, meaning they have a higher likelihood and are more commonly associated with heart disease. And that would be the chest pain in the middle of the chest radiating to the left arm, a dull aching or burning sensation. Uh, one characteristic is that is worth with, excuse me, worse with exertion and then tends to get better with rest or in people who have established heart disease, they can rest, take some nitroglycerin, which is a medication that relieves angina, 
and their symptoms will resolve. Typically last for minutes at a time. Um, and sometimes they're associated symptoms. People get lightheaded, feel sick to their stomach, break out in a sweat. And then for people who do have established coronary disease, they'll say, this is just like I felt when I had my heart attack or just like I felt before I had my stent put in. So some of the atypical features, and the reason I'm separating this is that a lot of times in um, you know, the news or magazines or however people online, I guess, how people get their information, um, people will describe that women often have atypical symptoms. And it is true that atypical sap symptoms happen more often in women, but most women still do get the typical symptoms when they have heart disease. So that being said, some of the atypical symptoms, if the pain is in a sharp, very small area of the chest, like just point one finger on it, if it lasts for just a second or so, or it's constant, something that lasts for hours and days at a time is much less likely to be related to heart artery narrowings. No relation to exertion at all. So it could happen just while sitting at rest, no associated symptoms. Um, if you can reproduce it by pushing on your chest, again, this is less common. And then emotional stress trigger. This one is considered atypical, but, um, Definitely anytime there's big emotional stress, there's a big um, surge of, of adrenaline that goes through the body. And that can definitely cause um, heart pain or certainly worsen angina in people who have established heart artery narrowings. So a few other symptoms that are less common, but not uncommon. These can also be signs of, of coronary disease. So shortness of breath that, can, that uh, happens, especially as people are trying to exert their, themselves and again, gets better with rest. Unusual or persistent heartburn or nausea. And then, it, and it is not unusual to have a combination of both typical and atypical symptoms. And that's kind of part of the evaluation and the reason why um, as a physician, it's weighing the sort of uh, pretest probability or the risks versus typical and atypical and kind of coming to a conclusion about how to proceed with an evaluation. So again, just a word about atypical symptoms, um, more common in women, in diabetic patients and the elderly. So if somebody is all three of those things, um, they definitely have a higher likelihood of having a more atypical presentation. Again, this does not mean that these groups of patients do not have typical symptoms because the most common symptom of heart attack or coronary disease far and away is chest pain. And that's one of the, one of the take home points today. So, and sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words to me. Um, and if something sort of does this where it makes you kind of put your hand in the middle of your chest and kind of stop what you're doing, definitely something to be paid attention to and further evaluated. So how about the urgency of having this chest pain evaluated? So the first thing I'll say is that this is not an if it should be evaluated, but more a when it should be evaluated. So if you have a gradual onset of symptoms, the symptoms are pretty predictable um, and they don't limit your sort of usual activities. This is something that I would say should be timely evaluated, but it's not an emergency, something that can be seen in the clinic, make the clinic appointment and be evaluated. If there's any abrupt worsening though, or acceleration of symptoms, um, symptoms that occur at rest or wake you in the middle of the night, those types of patterns of the symptom do increase the urgency. And if the symptoms are very severe, such as, you know, really can't breathe sitting at rest, breaking out in a sweat, those kinds of things, obviously that definitely accelerates the evaluation need even further. So let's talk about that sort of emergent evaluation. This is something typically comes on very abruptly, chest pain at rest that is persistent, and especially if it has associated symptoms, shortness of breath, sweating, nausea, Again, this requires emergent evaluation, call 911, um, 
and please don't drive to the hospital. We say this a lot and it, it happens that even if people don't drive themselves, they say, oh, well, I'll have my spouse or my whoever, you know, drive me. And the reason we don't recommend that is um, in case something happens on the way, if somebody's having a heart attack, they can have abnormal heart rhythms. Um, and it's, um, you just don't have what you need to, to be able to help that person if something, something happens. So that's the reason for requesting that people don't drive themselves. Um, that kind of presentation is concerning for a heart attack. And it is often caused by a completely blocked artery. And the goal in this kind of situation is to get that blood vessel opened as quickly as possible. Uh, time is muscle is kind of one of the things that we we live by, especially as interventional cardiologists, the heart muscle does not have the ability to regenerate itself. So if there is damage that's done to the heart muscle by a heart attack, um, that is something that is not, we, we can't get that back. So the longer the heart is without good blood supply and oxygen, the more damage is done. So that's why things really um, progress pretty expeditiously in this situation. So as far as the physician evaluation, the sort of order type and speed of the evaluation, again, dep depends on the situation. So in the scenario I just sort of laid out where a patient's being brought in by ambulance, everything that I'm describing here is happening all at the same time. And there's probably, you know, a physician, a few nurses, you know, multiple people kind of doing things all at the same time in order to get the patient to that procedure to get that blood vessel open. So history, um, we'll talk about symptoms, risk factors, physical examination, listen to the heart and lungs, um, check pulses, again, listening over blood vessels to find other evidence of, of uh, narrowings in arteries, and then a resting EKG. And this is the most important diagnostic test probably in the emergent situation where if there's an active heart attack evident, then we go directly to an emergency procedure to get that blood vessel open. So I'm gonna step back just a little to the more non-emergent evaluation. So if, um, again, you're in that situation where you've noticed something's different, new symptoms gonna be seen in the clinic, um, you'll meet with the physician, go through history, kind of talk about risks, those kinds of things. And then usually we're going to decide to do a stress test for further evaluation. And there are a couple uh, versions of those. There is an exercise test with just EKG monitoring. And those are a little less commonly done nowadays because a stress test with imaging actually gives us a little more specific information. Um, we can use both ultrasound imaging with the stress test or nuclear imaging. And the echo imaging stress tests are a little more uh, technically demanding and they're a little more difficult to get an adequate stress because the just the logistics of getting ultrasound pictures when someone's heart rate is still very elevated, which is what we wanna do, is a little bit difficult. So most of us opt now for doing exercise nuclear imaging, definitely, preferable to do exercise testing because that does give us additional information. So how far someone can exercise, what their heart rate and blood pressure does with exercise um, is all very important and can be prognostic, prognostic information as well. Um, we do have the ability to do pharmacologic stress testing, meaning we use medicine to stress the heart. And in situations where people you know, are unable to walk on a treadmill, um, have poor balance, those kinds of things. We definitely don't, don't want to have someone fall on a treadmill, but um, we do reserve those for situations typically when people are not able to physically exercise. So in thinking about the results of a stress test, if it's normal, that's great. Um, most often there's not further testing that's needed um, with the exception over the last few years now, we have kind of a new tool, and some of you maybe have had a cardiac calcium screening CAT scan, um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail later and why we might do that even with a normal stress test. If the stress test is abnormal, 
that's concerning for having significant heart artery disease. And then the next step is often imaging the heart arteries. And if you do have an abnormal stress test, that's typically gonna be with a procedure. So again, two basic ways that we're now, we now have to image the heart arteries. The cardiac catheterization is the procedure that I was just discussing. And again, we use that with an abnormal stress test or a patient that's very high risk, sometimes even on the basis of just history. Um, with that procedure, we are able to provide therapy in the form of stents um, when those are indicated. So the cardiac CT is the test that I was describing a little bit earlier, and it has kind of two parts to it, but the CT angiogram is non-invasive. You do need an IV, but we, we are able to put dye in through an IV and look at the heart arteries. The best use for this test is honestly in low risk patients where we're really not expecting to find much disease as a sort of rule out if people are familiar with that, where we say, look, your heart arteries look good. And the reason for the, the cardiac CT, it does have two parts to the scan. And so this is on the, on the premise that normal heart arteries have no visible calcium. So let's go back briefly to the situation where um, the stress test is completely normal. So a stress test being normal is a very good thing, but it doesn't mean that there is absolutely no disease in the arteries. It means that there's not enough disease to be causing symptoms or low oxygen you know, blood delivery to the heart muscle. But if you do have some visible calcium, that does allow us to say, look, it would be a good idea to, to add medicine, to add cholesterol medicine, add an aspirin to your regimen in order to prevent uh, or lessen the likelihood of a first heart attack or other cardiovascular event. So again, two parts, the screening calcium score can be done independently. And then we are actually sometimes able to use the contrast to look at the arteries in more low risk situations. Uh, one of the reasons that calcium, if there's a lot of calcium, then that really makes it difficult for the dye because the dye and the calcium actually look very similar on a, on a CAT scan. So um, again, it's an excellent study in appropriately selected patients, um, but there are still some limitations when you have a lot of heart, heart artery calcium. If you have pre-existing stents, that does make this a less sort of uh, helpful or appropriate test. And also you can't provide therapy with a, with a CAT scan if you do find severe disease. So the procedure, a cardiac catheterization, some other terms you might hear, heart cath, coronary angiogram, arteriogram. And this is a procedure to image the heart arteries. We uh, numb the area in the skin that's over the artery to be accessed with some local anesthesia. People typically are also given a little conscious sedation through an IV, but we do not use general anesthesia for this, which is one of the things that makes it uh, a sort of lower risk type of procedure. Uh, we enter the artery with a needle and put a small tube in place to kind of hold our spot in the blood vessel. And then we use longer tubes or catheters as they're called to advance up to the heart arteries and we use x-ray to watch our catheters go up and we inject contrast into the blood vessels and look for blockages. Um, this kind of procedure is generally done from either the leg or the femoral artery, which is in the groin area, or from the radial artery in the wrist. And transradial or radial artery catheterization is uh, how that's referred to. So again, if blockages are found, stents can usually be placed at the same time of the procedure if needed. Uh, there are situations where there are uh, significant amounts of blockages that need bypass surgery um, or complex other situations that, you know, we may need to take a pause and come back later. But if there's one spot that needs a stent, we can usually do that at the same time. Just a quick word about radial versus femoral. Again, um, still predominantly femoral procedures are done in the United States were up to when I started doing radial access um, over 12 years ago now, it was about three or 4% of procedures. Now the country's probably up to 35%. Um, 
I am a sort of default radial operator. And so I'm well into the high 90s of doing radial versus femoral cases. Um, and one of the reasons is that the risk of bleeding is overall higher in women with this procedure. And that radial access does decrease the bleeding risk of doing a heart cath. So a couple of uh, just words, again, comparing the two. Uh, people that have had a cath through their femoral artery, you have to lay flat after the procedure. Sometimes we need to keep those tubes in longer um, to let blood thinners wear off. There can be, have to be manual pressure held. Um, there are a higher incidence of access site complications compared to radial. Um, but there are some good things about femoral. There are times where we need to use larger tubes for specific complex procedures. Um, and most often we can do most things through a radio, but there's definitely a need for femoral access. And I don't want to, you know, make it be that people say, oh my gosh, I don't want that ever, because <laughs> there are definitely times where that's preferable. Um, but with a radial procedure, you can sit up right away. We get the tube out right at the end of the procedure, you have a little wristband on to hold pressure. Um, and again, lower access site complication risks. So... And one more sort of maybe helpful picture. Um, so again, normal artery, no plaque. Here's an artery that has plaque in it. And people kind of wonder how, how we get a stent in there. Um, and once our catheter is in, we put a wire down the middle of the blood vessel. And this is a balloon in the blue there. And it has a stent that's collapsed onto the balloon. And so that gets advanced into the blood vessel. And then a balloon gets blown up and the stent is left behind. The plaque is pushed up against the wall and that uh, pathway is opened up for good blood flow and then the balloon and the wire come out. Now, uh, treatment of coronary disease, I, I've been talking a lot about procedures and stents, but very important to know that prevention, risk reduction, and medications are the mainstays of treatment in the long term. So, um, I want to be clear about that. Again, I talked a lot about procedure, but the most important thing is medications and risk reduction from diet, exercise, and all the things that are kind of good for us. So stenting procedures do improve outcomes at the time of a heart attack. Again, we want to limit the amount of damage done by a heart attack. And then stenting and sometimes bypass surgery are needed, not only to relieve symptoms, but also to help with heart mortality from cardiac disease. So a sort of last conclusion slide, again, coronary disease is the number one killer of women in the United States. So important to know about and um, seek evaluation for. Chest pain and similar symptoms should be evaluated. And again, the urgency of that depends on symptoms. Um, medical therapy and risk factor modification are the primary long-term treatments for coronary disease. Um, stenting at the time of a heart attack does improve outcomes and lessens heart damage. And stenting and or bypass surgery are also used to relieve symptoms and to improve overall mortality risk in some situations. Um, I think I'm about at time. So um, I think I should probably turn over to Lisa here. And if we have time at the very end, I'm happy to show some uh, images of some heart arteries, but I think time-wise we'll move over and have Lisa get started. Thank you. I'm getting my screen pulled up here with my slides. Um, can you all see my show, my slideshow? Yes, we can. And he, okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Demetrioulis. Um, it was great to kind of hear behind the scenes what happens if you do end up uh, with the symptoms of coronary artery disease and what the next steps are. And of course, you know, kind of thinking back to those modifiable risk factors, um, I'm here to talk to you about how nutrition can really play a role. Um, so my part of the presentation is called Food to Fuel Your Heart. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how certain foods and nutrients in foods can help support your health from the standpoint of um, really the overall goals of uh, eating for heart health in a way to control your cholesterol and your triglyceride levels, to keep your blood sugar levels balanced, to help regulate your blood pressure and get it back down to normal range, and ultimately also to achieve and maintain a healthy weight. 
Um, so again, as I'm talking today, just want to say that I might talk about specific foods or specific nutrients in foods, but not necessarily want to over emphasize them as like, uh, you know, if you just eat this, your heart attack risk is going to go way down. It's like, really, we need to think about the overall pattern, the overall dietary pattern that we're, that we're eating and, um, and try to do as much of these things as we can, um, in a balanced way. So uh, hopefully you leave today with some good ideas for what that looks like. And, um, so let's kind of speak just gen in general terms, a, health, a heart healthy diet really emphasizes a foundation of plant-based whole foods. So really uh, focusing on vegetables, beans um, or legumes, whole grains, fruits, um, nuts and seeds. Those are all of your plant-based foods. And then of course, um, allowing also for some animal foods as well, uh, lower fat dairy, um, poultry and lean cuts of meat, um, fish that are particularly high in omega threes and, and emphasizing healthy fats. So I'll speak a little bit more about each one of those as we go through here. And um, as we said at the beginning, uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat and we'll definitely try to address them at the end. Um, so the heart healthy diet is also going to limit certain foods or nutrients because of the, their risk for um, impacting some of those modifiable risk factors that we spoke about. So we want to limit our intake of saturated and trans fats. I'll talk about where those come from in the next slide. Um, we want to limit our intake of red meats, processed meats like bacon and sausage and hot dogs and things like that. Um, soda and sugary beverages uh, because of their impact on our blood sugar levels. Um, added sugars overall, but really most of those sugars are coming a lot from our sweetened beverages. Um, foods that are pr made primarily of white flour because they're more of a faster acting carbohydrate that can really um, cause imbalances in our blood sugar levels. And then we're also going to look at the role of sodium and how it uh, may play a role in elevating heart, I'm sorry, elevating blood pressure. And then also we'll touch on alcohol as well. So let me start by kind of talking a little bit about fats in the diet. Um, I mentioned that a heart healthy diet limits trans fats and saturated fats and to some extent cholesterol. We know that high serum cholesterol, like when you get your labs done, you get a lipid panel and you find out that you have high cholesterol, um, those levels are more better correlated with a dietary intake of too much saturated fat and too much trans fat than too much cholesterol from foods. So ultimately, you know, you can still eat eggs, you can still eat some foods that contain cholesterol, but it's really good to kind of dial in to looking closer at um, where are those saturated fats coming from. They may be coming from, you know, the fattier cuts of meat that have more of that marbling or the, um, the full fat dairy products um, or the higher fat cheeses. So if we're eating too many of those, those can play a role in um, increasing our, our LDL cholesterol. Um, it, trans fats can play a role in increasing our LDL cholesterol, and they come into our diet from fried foods that we might get at fast food restaurants, but you also see them in hydrogenated oils that might be found in pastries and desserts and other things that are really fun to eat. <laughs> so we have to kind of watch our intake of some of those things as well. And um, trans fats, um, they can uh, decrease our HDL cholesterol, which is that good cholesterol that we, we want around and they increase our LDL cholesterol. So the research that's kind of looked at dietary approaches to improving cholesterol levels um, show that when you replace or you reduce the amount of saturated fats and trans fats in the diet and you replace them more with monounsaturated heart healthy fats from things like olive oil, nuts and seeds, and those polyunsaturated fats like those omega-3s are a type of polyunsaturated fat found in cold water fish. Uh, that we have a better outcome with uh, cholesterol levels. So let's see here. So we do, we, we want to prioritize healthy fats. We don't necessarily want to go fat free. Uh, and as I mentioned, your cold water fish um, are a rich source of omega threes. And the recommendation is to eat about two, two servings per week of that or roughly eight ounces of cold water fish per week. Um, wild salmon's a great option for that. Um, tuna, 
uh, sardines, if you like uh, sardines, those can be uh, made into something as well. So there's a lot of different options for that. Trout is a cold water fish. Um, your nuts and seeds are going to be healthy for your heart because they provide phytosterols, um, which help to lower cholesterol as well. And some nuts and seeds contain omega-3s like walnuts, for example, as well as ground flax seeds and chia seeds are going to have those anti-inflammatory omega-3s. And all nuts and seeds have the antioxidant vitamin E. So when we're talking about, you know, when um, Dr. Demetrius was talking about the blood vessels and the, the plaque formation, those plaques form in areas where they become irritated. And a vitamin E is an antioxidant that kind of help um, keep your cells healthy, uh, keep them more resilient and hopefully less inflamed over time. And um, we also see vitamin E coming into our diet from things like avocados, which provide monounsaturated heart healthy fat as well. And I know you've all heard um, extra virgin olive oil being good for you, uh, again, because of its monounsaturated fat and its vitamin E. And again, um, um, olive oil has been shown to help really promote the health and the resilience of our blood vessels. And then um, as far as cooking oils, I usually alternate between extra virgin olive oil if I'm maybe roasting some vegetables in the oven. But if I'm sauteing on the stove, I use a higher heat oil like avocado oil because it's less likely to burn in the pan. And we don't want the oils that we're cooking with to oxidize because um, that just causes damage in our food that can then later cause damage in the body once we ingest it. So as far as red meat goes, uh, we wanna overall reduce our intake of red meats. So uh, beef, um, pork, lamb, and select leaner cuts when we do include, include those in our diet. So you can tell they're leaner cuts if they have the word loin or they're a round cut, those tend to be leaner. Um, when you're opting for um, ground beef, try to get something that's 90% lean. And, um, and those will naturally be, you know, you won't have as much of the fat to, to trim off if you're getting ready to cook it. Um, one of the methods that I like to use is to incorporate more veggies into my meat-based dishes. So if I'm making fajitas or if I'm making hamburgers, um, I'll maybe mix some uh, chopped mushrooms in there. So I literally will chop up some mushrooms really finely and make them into my hamburger patties. Um, it's like eight ounces of beef to, no, I'm sorry, one pound of beef to about eight ounces of mushrooms that are finely chopped and they can make really nice flavorful patties that, um, that are really uh, flavorful and juicy. Plus they have <clears throat> some of that extra fiber from the mushrooms. And there's a particular kind of fiber in mushrooms called beta-glucan that's been studied in its um, ability to help lower cholesterol levels. So it's adding plant-based foods to that meat-based dish uh, to get some of those added benefits. Um, overall, we also want to just increase plant-based proteins that are minimally processed. So, you know, using beans, whether they're canned or cooking from scratch, Edamame is a really great plant-based uh, protein. It's a baby soybean that's uh, complete protein and high in iron and uh, fiber as well. Tempeh and tofu are, um, you know, more eaten in the vegetarian world, um, but they can be part of a, of a flexitarian diet. If you eat, you know, if you still eat meat, there's ways to incorporate those foods into the rotation of what you're eating on a regular basis, just so you have a way to reduce your overall intake of red meat. So you're not getting as much saturated fat in the diet from that. Um, some low fat dairy options are recommended. Um, obviously dairy is a great source of calcium, important for bone health, um, but low fat dairy in particular is not gonna be as high in the saturated fats that we're trying to lower. So I've listed here a couple of options. Um, you know, when you're opting for cheese, more often try to get the part skin mozzarella and the Swiss, um, you know, Yogurt, going for the low-fat, um, higher-protein Greek yogurt. Um, they have a really good low-fat cottage cheeses out there. Um, I always look for cultured dairy that has live active cultures. So um, there's a, a cottage cheese out there called, I think it's called Good Culture. Um, and it actually is like a yogurt in the sense that it's been uh, cultured with some of those live active um, bacteria that are good for your gut health as well. So uh, that gives you some suggestions for how to incorporate some of that low fat dairy and to decrease your saturated fat intake from them. Um, sugar is a big issue uh, that only started becoming more um, 
paid attention to in recent years uh, because the role of sugar in heart disease um, is pretty important. Um, sugar can be an irritant to the blood vessels. And so when we have irritation in the lining of the blood vessels, there's gonna be more of a likelihood uh, for places for that LDL cholesterol to adhere to and cause those plaques to form. So that's why it's really important for your doctor to check your fasting blood sugar level, to check your hemoglobin A1C uh, periodically to make sure you don't have uh, prediabetes or di diabetes. And we have, um, we tend to get to that point of um, having elevations in our blood sugar when we have a diet that's high in refined flours or refined sugars. Um, and we know that when we eat too much of these foods, we have the tendency to have increases in our triglyceride levels. We have decreases in our good cholesterol and we decrease um, our ability for insulin to do its job properly. So insulin's the hormone that keeps your blood sugar levels regulated by taking the sugar out of the bloodstream and helping it get into the cell where it can be used for energy. Um, when insulin is not, when your cells aren't sensitive enough to insulin, then that's when your blood sugar can build up in your bloodstream and become problematic. So some ways to reduce our intake of added sugars or simple sugars is, um, you know, really looking at overall, where is sugar coming into our diet? If we're drinking sugar sweetened beverages, such as soda, fruit drinks, um, sweetened teas, sweetened coffee drinks, energy drinks, sports drinks, those are kind of um, liquid forms of sugar that can uh, hopefully be modified with a healthy alter healthier alternative. And um, as I mentioned, more than half of the added sugar in our diet tends to come from sugar sweetened beverages. So um, that would definitely be a place I usually start with, with helping people identify places that they can make modifications. Um, other sources of course, include things like baked goods, candy, sweetened cereals, um, certain dairy products and desserts. And it's not to say you can't ever have a bowl of ice cream or enjoy, you know, birthday cake and things like that. I'm not trying to say don't ever eat sugar. Just try to pay attention to places where you may be getting too much over time and, um, and find, you know, those healthier swaps where you can. Um, so the American Heart Association actually put out some guidelines um, for label reading and just really trying to pay attention to how much sugar might be coming into your diet. And they recommend limiting added sugar to um, roughly nine teaspoons or roughly 36 grams if you're reading for added sugars on, on the label per day for men. Of course, men get away with a little bit more uh, because they have more muscle mass to burn some of those sugars. Um, and six teaspoons or about 24, 25 grams per day for women and children over two. So if that gives you a, a good rule of thumb when you're like, okay, I'm going to look at my, my protein bar that I've been eating every day, or I'm going to look at my uh, soda that I drink every day and see where I fall in terms of those recommendations. And then maybe see some places you can dial back. Um, on average, uh, typically adults get about 17 teaspoons of sugar per day, which is about double the limit for men and triple for women. So it can sneak in there where we may not uh, realize that it's, um, you know, really impacting our diet and increasing some of those risk factors for heart disease. So um, on the nutrition facts label, you can look at the, I don't worry so much about um, total sugars you see here. We look at the added sugars, which um, you know, for every four grams of sugar, that's about one teaspoon. So um, just pay attention to the added sugars. If you're eating whole fruit, um, you know, or sometimes like if you look at a can of tomato sauce, it might say four grams of sugar. Well, that's not, added sugar that's just naturally occurring that's part of that particular fruit. So I wouldn't worry so much about um, sugars that are part of something already. Just look at what's been added. Um, as far as, um, you know, I mentioned uh, focusing our diet on plant-based whole foods, those whole grains, those beans, those vegetables, and those fruits, um, because they are going to provide the dietary fiber we need to help keep our cholesterol levels down. And, um, the fiber acts almost like a magnet to help to prevent your body from reabsorbing cholesterol that we're trying to get rid of through our bowel movements. So we can, when we eat more fiber, roughly about 21 to 25 grams a day per, for women and 25 to 38 per day for, for men, um, this can help lower our, our cholesterol level. Fiber is very filling. It's very satiating. It can um, balance our blood sugar levels and keep the meal more um, rounded out and satisfying. 
And uh, this ultimately can aid in weight management uh, because we're more satisfied by the meals that we're eating when we have more fiber in our diet. And of course, we all know that it helps promote regularity and prevents um, gastrointestinal diseases as well, which is the added benefit, um, not directly related to heart disease, but um, things that will be an added benefit. Um, soluble fiber is the main form of fiber um, that we want to focus on. I mean, almost all foods are a combination of insoluble or soluble, all plant-based foods. Um, so to give you an example, an apple, the skin on the apple is insoluble, where the, the middle part is more of the soluble fiber. Um, so, but soluble fiber we talk about for heart health because um, it, it absorbs some of that cholesterol um, in the lumen of your GI tract and helps you poop it out. And we tend to get soluble fiber from things like beans. We get around three to five grams per cup, around two grams for oatmeal, one and a half for barley. And as you can see, I've got some other examples listed there. So just thinking of ways um, you can incorporate some of these foods into your diet to really help you get to that 10 to 15 grams of soluble fiber per day um, if you're not already doing that. So this just gives you a few examples. Um, I can't emphasize enough getting a colorful variety of vegetables and fruits in the diet uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, they're a very rich source of those antioxidant polyphenols that keep our cells healthy and resilient. Um, they're high in fiber, as we spoke about on the previous slide. They're low in calories, so they're good for weight management. Um, for heart health, they're a really good source of potassium. Um, you really don't get more potassium anywhere else than from fruits and vegetables in your diet. And potassium is a mineral that helps um, with uh, the nervous system and the rhythm of your heart. So um, we want to make sure we're getting good dietary sources of potassium. And magnesium is another good one, another good mineral found in your vegetables and your fruits that helps kind of relax your muscles, relax your blood vessels, and is good for heart health in that way. Uh, in particular, there's a few veggies that I just want to highlight uh, that I think would be good to try to incorporate regularly, if not every day. Um, dark green leafy vegetables are high in folate, which is a B vitamin, uh, one of the B vitamins that helps keep um, homocysteine down. Homocysteine is a, uh, uh, something that can be measured in your bloodstream um, that is known to irritate the blood vessels. So uh, when we have enough folate and B12 and B6 in our diet, some of those other B vitamins uh, that can really keep our homocysteine in a better range so that it doesn't irritate our blood vessels. Um, tomatoes contain the antioxidant lycopene, which helps prevent the oxidation of our LDL cholesterol. Um, so having you know, tomato sauce, salsa, or fresh tomatoes, or other lycopene-rich foods like watermelon, um, or any of those red pigmented foods um, can really benefit from, for you in that way. Um, beets contain nitrates, which help to keep blood vessels dilated and healthy. So they're really concentrated and um, you know, they can be roasted and tossed into a salad or um, eaten boiled. And you know, um, again, I like to toss them with something like balsamic vinegar um, and maybe some walnuts. That would be a really heart healthy uh, way to eat beets. Um, so a little emphasis on specific fruits that have been shown to help with heart health, um, blood vessels like, or berries are good for supporting the health and the resilience of your blood vessels. They have a particular compound in them called anthocyanins. And I always remember this because our blood vessels are our arteries and are red and our veins are blue. So when we eat a variety of these blue and red pigmented foods, I remember these actually help our circulatory system um, because of those anthocyanins. Um, apples and pears are good fruits to focus on because they provide pectin, which is a type of soluble fiber. And then citrus has the antioxidant vitamin C and some of those bioflavonoids, all which help you know, support health and resilience of your cells and your blood vessels. I wanna to touch on sodium a little bit. Um, if you're somebody who has uh, high blood pressure or high blood pressure runs in your family, this might be something to pay closer attention to. Um, also, if you're somebody who tends to retain water weight um, or feels puffy, uh, sodium is something to, to look closer at in your diet. And I think uh, this can be 
um, challenging because we get most of the salt in our diet, not from the salt we add at the table from the salt shaker, but more from packaged and processed foods or foods that we might be eating outside of the home. So we don't always have a label to look at. Um, but when we can start selecting packaged items that have that are lower in sodium by default, like, for example, if I'm making soup, I always get a low sodium broth, um, you know, just to kind of reduce my overall intake. So the recommendation is to try to keep sodium less than 2300 milligrams per day. Um, and if somebody has high blood pressure, then they might need to dial it down even more to around 1500 milligrams per day. Um, there's a specific dietary um, recommendation that people with high blood pressure uh, can try called the DASH diet, which is um, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And it's a dietary pattern that's high in vegetables, fruits, lower fat dairy products, whole grains, um, poultry, nuts. And then of course it's low in sweets. Um, as we talked about, it's low in uh, salt, low in saturated fat and total fat. And then it's um, going to be rich in some of these minerals that I spoke about, potassium and magnesium, as well as protein and fiber. And so when you're looking at sodium on the label, what does that look like? Um, this just gives you some guidance that um, to keep your sodium intake in a healthy range, if you're looking at something on a label, we wanna to try to keep um, a meal or a main dish less than about 600 milligrams. Um, if it's an individual food item, you know, less than 480. If it's a small snack, maybe around 50 milligrams or less, if that gives you just some, some guidance when you're reading labels. Um, and uh, I also look at like the percent daily value. If it's less than 5% of the daily value for sodium, that's typically a very low sodium food. If it's greater than 20%, then that's typically a, a high sodium food. So just starting to tune in and see if there's things in your pantry that you can find a better option for um, is a good, a good place to start. Um, all right, lastly, I just wanna to touch on alcohol. Uh, the recommendation um, is to reduce alcohol intake to less than or equal to one drink per day for women or less than or equal to two drinks per day for men. Um, and just to kind of show you what a serving size is there, it's about 12 ounces of beer, one and a half ounces of like hard alcohol and five ounces of wine. Um, when we see somebody excessively using alcohol, it might be greater than three drinks uh, per day. And of course, you know, if somebody's on multiple medications, um, I always caution alcohol intake because they can be, it can be contraindicated with certain medications and can impact their um, effectiveness. So um, I wanna leave time for questions. I did um, in the slides just put like just a few kind of quick slides with some meal and snack ideas. Um, so I will leave those. I think they're gonna be shared with you all, but um, I wanna stop there and just open it up for questions. Uh, so see if there's anything we can clarify for you. Um, any any uh, questions that you might have right now? I didn't see anything come through in the chat, so. And feel free to unmute at this point if you have a question for Lisa. Lisa, I had a question. You were yes. you were you were talking about the difference in the oils. Mm -hmm. What was the uh, what was the oil that you can use when you want to? We have higher heat. Um, I tend to do um, avocado oil. It's a it, it's a it has a higher smoke point. So I don't know if you've ever noticed if you put, you know, a couple tablespoons of olive oil in your pan and then you're chopping your vegetables or whatever you're getting ready to put in your pan, you go back and it's burning or smoking. Um, that at that point, I would dump that oil out and start over because um, the oxidized oil is not, not good for us. Um, I don't have that same problem when I use a higher smoke point oil like avocado oil because it can tolerate that higher heat. And when you're heating oil on a stove top, that's more of a direct heat um, that can get hotter a lot quicker than like in the oven. Um, I, you can still roast your vegetables in olive oil. I think it you know, adds a lot more flavor when you do that. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, if I am cooking on the stove with olive oil, I'll keep my pan on a low to medium heat so it doesn't ever get to that, that um, burning point. <laughs> Okay, I see maybe a couple questions came. Uh, Laura likes um, 
the idea of having three rotating breakfast choices are that are easy and healthy. Any ideas? All right, Laura, I don't know if you see my slide is still up. Um, I've got a couple of different options here. I like to recommend, you know, again, a way to get that soluble fiber in by having the steel cut oats or rolled oats or even doing like an overnight oatmeal and then topping that with berries, nuts and seeds. Um, you could always batch cook your steel cut oats or your rolled oats and then just reheat as you need to. Um, uh, if you're somebody who likes something a little more savory, you could go with something like a whole grain toast with avocado um, and egg, or the other protein option there could be like a smoked wild salmon. Um, I don't know if any of you are Costco shoppers, but I found a pretty nice package of smoked wild salmon there that I can keep part in the freezer until I'm ready to use it. Um, and that will get you those omega-3s and those monounsaturated fats. And then, um, you know, uh, scrambled eggs or tofu scramble with just thinking about when you are having something, um, you know, how can you add more color? So anytime somebody's like, oh, I eat eggs for breakfast every morning, I'm like, well, can you add some salsa to that? Can you chop up some spinach, you know, really get some extra antioxidants and color in there. And then, um, you know, Greek yogurt with berries and chia seeds or any other nut or seed would be a good, you know, some good options. Um, Laura, I don't know if that helps give you some ideas. Um, a lot of times people eat sugar sweetened cereals and that's somewhere if the, it's like, okay, well, let's just find a healthier cereal option for you that's higher in fiber and lower in sugar. So I found like the, the Kashi um, cinnamon harvest or the island vanilla, the kind of shredded wheat tends to be a good high fiber, lower sugar option. Um, for if you just want something kind of like a cereal to eat, um, then that would be a good option too. Um, hopefully that gives you some good breakfast ideas. I have a couple of uh, lunch and dinner ideas here. And then if any more questions come in, we can address those. You know, I mentioned really just trying to find ways to make veggies the foundation of your lunch and dinner. So, you know, having a salad or stir fry that features a variety of vegetables, um, and then incorporating some protein, you know, maybe three ounces of protein, like uh, chicken or a leaner cut of beef. Um, I think it's always a good idea to add beans, again, for that soluble fiber and additional protein. Um, beans have um, anthocyanins in them as well, just like the berries. So they're good for cardiovascular health in that respect. And then um, if you're having a sandwich, try to see if you can get the whole grain bread and then add veggies to it, whether you're putting it on the sandwich or having it as a side. Um, I encourage people to try um, canned wild salmon and using that in place of tuna. Tuna is still fine, but you can get more of those omega-3s from the wild salmon if you wanna make that as your tuna salad and then add some chopped apple and walnuts into it. Um, and then I think homemade soups are really great because they make such good leftovers and you can eat them for, you know, a few days <laughs> or you can freeze them if you get tired of them and have them later. So I don't see, oh, let's see, we have another question. Okay. Uh, protein powders. So, um, you know, it, it depends. I don't always recommend protein powders across the board for everyone. It just depends on, I look, usually look at what their overall um, protein intake is looking like, and then see, do they need a little extra boost from a protein powder? Um, and, you know, depending on also how well somebody tolerates dairy or not, you know, there's plant-based protein powders out there. There's also whey protein. So sometimes I might recommend, um, uh, there's a Jaro is a brand that I recommend for the whey protein. Um, and then there's like plant-based proteins that have pea protein in it. Um, I think the big thing with protein powders that I caution people to look out for are just a lot of the additives that they put in, such as, um, they might have a lot of, um, extra artificial sweeteners in there that if it's something you're going to use every day, I don't, I don't, I try to encourage people not to do artificial sweeteners every day. Um, so those are things that I would label read with somebody on, on a, on a protein powder. Um, a lot of people are using things like collagen powder, and that would be fine. Um, again, it really just depends on your overall protein needs and where you might be getting protein in your diet from other sources. Some people like the collagen because they can stir it into their coffee or they can stir it into their oatmeal, and it dissolves pretty readily without really noticing it's there. Um, so again, it just it depends on the individual. Um, but if you have a more specific question about that, Laura, let me know. 
Any other questions? I want to be mindful of everybody's time because we've got a few minutes over, but I'm happy to stay on and answer, continue to answer questions. Um, but if we need to wrap up, I'll leave that in Mona and Megan's court. <laughs> I'm happy to stay on. Um, and for those of you that do have to leave, raise your hand if your mouth has been watering for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not sure which one of those lunch options I wish I had in my kitchen right now, Lisa. So thank you for those uh, ideas. Yeah. So any other questions for, for Lisa? <clears throat> well, I am so grateful for, again, for our partnership with uh, Advent and all of the amazing content that you bring to us. I do want to let you know, Megan and I have kind of been plotting and planning. We have a, another event scheduled for October 29th on site at Advent South. And it's gonna be a uh, mocktail happy hour education event from three to six. So it'll be on the central exchange calendar very, very soon. So Dr. Dimitrolos and Lisa and Megan, again, on behalf of Central Exchange, thank you so very, very much. I hope we all take away at least one nugget of information and can implement that in our lives. So thank you, Megan, any other? Thoughts or comments? Oh, just thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, like Mona already said, we'll be um, hosting, the Whole Health Institute will be hosting that event um, October 29th. So um, just uh, stay tuned for those announcements, but we're excited to be here. And thank you, Dr. Dimitrulis, for being on the call today. Um, a lot of great information shared. So thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Right. Thanks all. Bye. Bye-bye.